In this video, we're going to go over the Wittig reaction. And so here we have a ketone, and we are going to react it with a phosphonium illid, which looks like that. What do you think the major product for this reaction will be? The Wittig reaction converts ketones into alkenes. And one thing I like to do is rotate the ketone in such a way that the carbonyl group faces the CH2 group. All you need to do is replace the oxygen with the CH2 group, or whatever is attached to that double bond. And so the product for this reaction looks like this, which you can draw this way if you want. And so as you can see, the Wittig reaction is very useful for making alkenes from ketones. Now let's try another example. So let's say we have this ketone and we wish to react it with an illid that looks like this. Go ahead and predict the major product for this reaction. So what we need to do is replace the oxygen with this group. And so the product will look like this. Now, I'm going to draw it differently. If you want to, you can rotate this molecule. You don't have to, but if you want to. So we have an ethyl group on one side and a methyl group on the other side. And then it's going to react with the illid. And so let's replace the oxygen with this group. For me, I think it's easier to see it this way. Now let's redraw the product. And we're going to center our drawing on the CC double bond. So first we have a carbon-carbon double bond. Here we have an ethyl group attached to it. So that's CH3, CH2. And then here we have a methyl group, so just CH3. Now attached to this carbon is a hydrogen and a methyl group. So we could put the H at the top or we could put the H on the bottom. And so as you can see, the Wittig reaction can give you a mixture of E and Z isomers. So on the left side, this is the highest priority group. And on the right side, the methyl group has more priority than the hydrogen. So this is the E isomer. And here we have the Z isomer. Now let's look at another example. So here we have cyclohexanone. And let's react it with an illid that can be presented in a different form. So sometimes you'll see a positive charge on the phosphorus atom and a negative charge on the carbon atom. If you see this, this is one way in which you could represent the illid. But if you take the lone pair and form a pi bond, then you can get the illid that you're used to seeing, which looks like this. And so let's react that with cyclohexanone, which I'm going to draw it this way. So let's replace the oxygen with the group that we see here. So the product is going to look like this. And that's one way in which you can draw. Now let's focus on the CC bond. So on the left side, that carbon is part of the cyclohexane ring. On the right side, this carbon atom is bonded to a hydrogen and an ethyl group. So there are no cis or trans or E and Z isomers in this example, because for the carbon on the left, the top is the same as the bottom. So in this case, we only get just one product. 
So now let's go over the mechanism for the Wittig reaction. Now what we need to start with is triphenylphosphine. It's basically a phosphorus atom that is attached to three benzene rings. Okay, that is a terrible benzene ring. Let's do that again. And the phosphorus has a lone pair. So that's PH3P. And of course, let's not forget the double bonds in this ring. So what we're going to do is we're going to react triphenylphosphine with an alkyl halide. Now, this alkyl halide, you want it to be either methyl bromide or a primary alkyl halide because this is an SN2 reaction. Secondary halides could work, but just be careful with those. Tertiary halides, they don't work very well for SN2 reactions, so you need to avoid that. But ideally, you want to use methyl halides and primary halides because they work very well for an SN2 reaction. So here we have ethyl bromide. So what we're going to do is add an ethyl group to the phosphorus. So right now, this is a CH2 and this is a CH3. So we can write it as PH3P-CH2CH3. Now the phosphorus atom has four bonds. So it has a positive formal charge. So I'm going to redraw the structure like this. So I'm going to write out the CH2. Now the next step is to react it with butyl lithium. Whenever you have a carbon atom that is attached to a metal, that carbon atom is nucleophilic. And so that carbon is going to abstract a proton from the carbon that's attached to the phosphorus group. Because this hydrogen is more acidic than these hydrogens. The conjugate base is stabilized by resonance. And so once we take away this hydrogen, we're going to have a negative charge on this carbon. And so this is one resonance form of the ilid. And to draw the other resonance form, we could take a lone pair and form a pi bond. And so these are the two resonance forms of the ilid. Now, for the next step, I'm going to use this resonance form to react with the ketone or an aldehyde. So let's use acetaldehyde as an example. And let's put the ilid in the right position to react with it. So the ilid that we're using, the carbon had a hydrogen and a methyl group attached to it. So this carbon has a negative formal charge, and the phosphorus atom has a positive formal charge. Now the carbonyl carbon is partially positive, and the oxygen has a partial negative charge. So therefore, this nucleophilic carbon is attracted to the electrophilic carbon. And so it's going to attack this carbon, causing the pi bond to break, preventing carbon from having five bonds. And so these pi electrons will be used to form a bond between oxygen and phosphorus. And so what we're going to get is a four-membered ring that looks like this. So this is what we now have. This is called an oxaphosphatane. Now, what do you think is going to happen next? We know we need to generate the alkene. We need to form a pi bond here. And so therefore, this bond and this bond has to break in order to get the alkene. So let's focus on the carbon-phosphorus bond. When that bond breaks, where are the electrons going to go? Are they going to go towards the carbon atom? Or are they going to go towards the phosphorus atom? Now, if you go to Google Images and you look up electronegativity table, you'll see that carbon is more electronegative than phosphorus. So carbon bears the partial negative charge relative to phosphorus, and phosphorus bears the partial positive charge. So when the carbon-phosphorus bond breaks, 
those electrons are going to go towards the more electronegative carbon. Now, what about the carbon-oxygen bond? We know that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So when the carbon-oxygen bond breaks, those electrons will go towards the oxygen. And so what we're going to get is a triphenyl phosphine oxide as a side product. And our main product will be the alkene. And so we have a hydrogen and a methyl group on both sides. So this is the cis isomer. We can also get the trans isomer. And typically, the trans isomer is more stable than the cis isomer. And so you want the bulky groups to be further apart from each other. So this is going to be easier to form. But you do get a mixture of both. And so that is the mechanism for the Wittig reaction.